Today's episode is brought to you by West End, South Australia's most iconic beer. Now, it's a clean, fresh draft beer. There's nothing more local, nothing more South Australian than cracking a red tin. The media had made me feel like, if you don't do this, like, you, you have failed. Like, he can't win a slam because he's not fit enough or mentally he's not strong enough or whatever. A lot of my career was about trying to win a major and that when I finally did it, yeah, I was just, I was just relieved. It wasn't excitement, happiness. It was relief that I'd done it. And I sort of wish that that moment had felt different. Sir Andy Murray is a bona fide tennis superstar. His CV boasts three Grand Slam victories, including, of course, a couple of Wimbledons, two Olympic gold medals, an Olympic silver and a Davis Cup title alongside elder brother Jamie. And there's a whole lot more in that CV too. And at 35 years young, he is still going strong, and that is despite setting off all the metal detectors at every airport he goes through because of the extensive hip surgery that he's had. It's actually amazing that he can still play at this level given the amount of work he's had done on that hip. It is an absolute honour to welcome one of tennis's all-time superstars to join us right here. Let's go. Welcome along to the Soda Room, a place where we get to know the real stories behind some of the biggest names in the game. It was like we had won the grand final. I just got some new boots. It was something yeah. special for me. Did you understand the significance of that moment? Oh, Captain? yeah. Nothing compared. That's what I thought I had to do as a leader. You got the same undies on. <laughs> <laughs> I've got exactly the same ones on. Andy, welcome along to Adelaide. Great to have you here. Now, you know, this town actually is a, a town that is big on a few of your friends. Roger Rashid's from here. Darren Cahill's from here. Friends? Were well, they your friends? <laughs> can we call them your friends? Is that what they say? Yes, they reckon they're your friends. Or can we say acquaintances or colleagues? Colleagues. Let's go with <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> so this is essentially a big football town, big Aussie rules football town. Okay. So welcome along, mate. Great to have you here. Thank you. Now, what I needed to do just to make you feel comfortable in this town, if you were here, you have to have an Aussie rules football. Oh, nice. Now, I'm not sure whether you've ever had your hands on one of these. Do you know what? I have not. Never? I've never had my hands on them. I've really? seen it. I've seen a few of the Aussie players. Yes playing with them on the tour. Yes. But I've never... Well, obviously, yeah, Thanasi, Kokonagas, Leighton Hewitt, they all sort of grew up in football terms. Yeah. Or as we call it, football. So, mate, I thought if you're here, you can't leave Australia without one of those. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, which is uh, which is for you to have a little play with. Just be careful, mate, because if you haven't kicked it for a while, you probably jag a calf or a hamstring, and we don't want that to happen okay. in leading into the event. But when I look at that, you were actually pretty talented with the round ball, with, with the soccer ball. I don't know about that. I mean, I, I played a lot as a kid uh, to a decent level, mm. but it was one of the things that was actually was difficult to know uh, with football in comparison to tennis at the time because I played both to a good level. But yeah. with tennis, I was, when I was like 13, 14, we would travel to like tournaments uh, internationally and yeah. there was a ranking system and everything. So when it came to choosing between football and tennis, soccer and tennis, I knew at the time when I was like 14 that I was in the top two or three in Europe for my age, whereas with football, mm. I was one of the better players in my local team. But you don't really know, like, you know, I was a decent player for the team that I played with, but that was in, you know, central Scotland. Yeah. And in reality, I probably wasn't, you know, wasn't very good. So You got a call up with Rangers Academy though, didn't you? Yeah, I got asked to train at the Rangers School of Excellence. Yeah, when I was 14, basically. And then that was when I had to, you know, I had to make my decision because I, I, I couldn't really, I couldn't do both. You know, my family also, like, for them to be carting me around to tennis training and then, mm. you know, they, they both worked, both of my parents and stuff and that, it was just, yeah, it was too too difficult. But yeah, and I decided to go with tennis purely because I knew that internationally I was one of the one of the better ones. Whereas with football, I, I didn't really know. So essentially, it was a bit of a no-brainer. To make yeah, that call? yeah, I think so. I, I like to think if I decided to pick football, that I would have been brilliant at that. But yeah, the reality is, I was probably pretty average. Um, and 
yeah, tennis was was the right call for me. Well, I think also too, though, given your work ethic and your physical ability and your mindset, you'd have to have been all right anyway. You might have even been at the World Cup recently as a 35 year old <laughs> well, trying to hold. Unfor- unfor- well, Scotland, no, yeah, Scotland, unfortunately, Scotland, Scot- were- Scotland have, <laughs> haven't. Well, they've been in one World Cup since yeah. since I was born, um, <laughs> unfortunately, but. Yeah. Tell us about your relationship with Australia because you've obviously had so much success here with all the finals at the Australian Open. Do you still love coming here? I love it. Yeah, and it's always one of my well, my favorite trips of the year. Yeah, had I've played over the years some of my best tennis mm-hmm. here and there's no like there's no doubt about that just because I, I didn't manage to win the Australian Open. You know, I still reflect yes. on my time yes. yet. yet. <laughs> um, you know, I still reflect on you know my time here mm. really well like i've i've played great i've made some yeah incredible memories here and yeah just unfortunately just didn't quite manage to to get over the line at the Aussie Open mm. but yeah it was also coming up against i mean what Novak's done here mm. you know i can look back at those matches yes there's things i would have liked to have done better but yep. you know the guys won here nine times so mm. wasn't wasn't easy with Australia, of course, now that you, you're coming back, I think it was just about four years ago, January 2019, you're at that point where your hit was giving you enormous grief and you'd had that one op, I think, by then. Yeah. Um, and you played in the first round and I think you said before this could before that match, this could be my last tournament. Yeah. We're now nearly four years on, 35 years young, and you're still going. So it's been a pretty remarkable three or four years given where you were back then. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously at that, time um when i spoke at the press conference i for about well yeah it was it was a couple of years basically i've been in i've been in a lot of pain my my hip had been giving me issues for Mm. a number of years um before it got to a point where what i couldn't couldn't play tennis anymore couldn't train couldn't do just day-to-day stuff normally i'd already had one sort of operation I actually had it in in melbourne um the the previous year mm. which you know hadn't changed anything in terms of my pain and discomfort and because of the nature of the surgery that i was going to have to have you know i didn't know if i was going to be able to play again because mm. i didn't have anyone to you know to look to um really as as a reference to say that you know i'd be able to come back to play high level singles again so yeah, it's it's been yeah an incredible few years really since then. I've been amazed at how well the the hips sort of held up um, to the demands of of what what I'm asking it to do. Yeah, I mean, th- th- there's other challenges around having a you know metal hip. Like mm. the rest of your body has to compensate a little bit. Like my pelvis and everything around that that area has had to learn to move in a different way. Like the biomechanics have changed quite a lot around there. So I've had lots of little niggles, but I think now my body is kind of used to it. And for the last probably six to nine months, I've actually, I felt really good and I feel good just now. Do you set the scanners off at the airport? Every time, yeah. Yeah. So now with those big ones where you stand there with the arms out, you can actually see them resurfacing on the hip. I mean, it's painful. Like I walk through every time and they're like, do you have a watch on? I'm like, no, I have a metal hip. Um, and they're like, okay, you need to go back through, you need to take your shoes off, put that. I'm like, it's not going to make any difference. <laughs> but yeah, every single time, yeah, yeah, I set it off. So essentially, if it's almost like a type of hip replacement, isn't it? Where they put a metal cap on the, the top of the femur and then yeah. they put a metal sort of coverage on the inside of the pelvis. Yeah. Which is pretty remarkable that you're still running around playing world-class tennis. Yeah, it is. And I, I don't, I'm not saying that because <laughs> I'm saying it to like uh, make myself look better. Yeah, yeah. I think other people will be able to do that as yeah. well. I, it's more that it's remarkable how successful the surgery is mm. and how well, like I said, it's held mm. up under what it is that I'm asking it to do. Yeah. And obviously I, I hope that not loads of players have to have it in the future. But, you know, if there is you know, some players that are in their late twenties and yep. still feel like, you know, they have something to give to the mm. sport, um, that it's great that there is an option there that, you know, it's allowed me to play for so far, you know, another 
two and a half, three yeah. years, and I'm hoping that you know I'm going to be able to play for a few more. You know, so that's that's been amazing. Yeah, I think Bob Bryan had the same thing, didn't he? Yeah, Bob Bryan. So yeah, so he had the same operation, and he came back to play doubles for a year, mm -hmm. um, and you know was was pretty successful with it. Yep. And I, I spoke to him loads during the because we were going through the same issues mm. at the same time we were in communication before he'd even had the operation about you know what we were doing training wise and you know things that were maybe helping us or stuff that you know wasn't mm. um so after he had that operation um i was speaking to him every day and just checking up on him pretty much to to see how he's getting on to see if this was you know going to be an option for me and yeah, I mean, he said that he sort of felt like he got back to about sort of 90%, mm. um, you know, and I felt like, yeah, for me that that would be still good enough to potentially, you know, compete, but, you know, I, d I didn't know for sure. Are you at 90, do you reckon? Or where do you feel? Have you, can you put a percentage on it? <sighs> I mean, it, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to say. It's not, not where it was, mm. um, you know, and... My, at my peak or in my mid twenties, but you know it's it's good enough, you know, to still be able to to compete against the the best players. So, you know, that's that's good enough for me. If we go back to that sort of time in twenty nineteen, you, you lose that first round. I think they put a video montage up from memory. It was almost like the swan song. Did you actually at that point think, "Geez, this could actually be it"? Yeah, I did. Yeah. And I remember speaking to my team straight after that match, like, and I, I said to them at the time, I was like, well, you know, if that's it, like, what, like, what a great way to finish. And although the match, you know, I didn't win the match and, you know, I would have liked, you know, everyone would like a fairy tale finish and, mm. you know, winning a grand slam or whatever, but, you know, it doesn't really work like that in sport. There's very few players that sort of finish their, their careers that way that, the way that, that match was and the way that I'd that I, I'd fought through the match and th how clear it was like the discomfort that I was in I mean I couldn't walk properly by that stage anyway and at the yeah. end of the match I was you know I was in bits but it was like yeah an incredible atmosphere yeah. like you know an exciting match and yeah I'd basically left it all out there which is what I discussed with my team and like psychologist that I was working with at the time, like I was, that was what I wanted to get out of that experience and that match. That if it was the last time, like they're the things that, like if that was the the last memory mm -hmm. of me on a tennis court, that yeah. that's what I would have wanted it to be. So I, I was fine with that being being the end, uh, even though you know I still would have liked to have kept kept going well the good news is it's not the end mate so we yeah. can keep going and we're sitting out here looking at Memorial Drive that's been redeveloped and all ready to watch you uh tear it up over the next couple of weeks and so in the build up to the Australian Open you I know have been very meticulous in your preparation and the way that you go about preparing your body and I think there's been you know some amazing stories in the past about uh, how how you are how professional with that now I understand you you love your four hundreds, don't you? You're a big four hundred meter runner. I, that... I I used to like doing them, but I stopped that probably it was around two thousand thirteen. Yeah. But I used to do a lot of lot of four hundred meter. That's essentially reps. probably the hardest run. In, yeah. In track and field. Well, the, the the unfortunate thing for me about that is that it is the hardest, but that was the dis distance that I was best at. Yeah. You know, so it was like. <laughs> I had I did a lot of that stuff probably yeah. because I was I was good at it. Yeah. But it's it's a painful distance. It's yeah. bloody hard because you're mm. essentially sprinting for 400. I suppose once you start going beyond that 800, you can pace yourself. Mm. But for 400, there's no pacing. Yeah. So we we would do uh, like 10 reps, mm. um, and it was just uh, one to one work to rest ratio. Right. So I would do like you had to run it inside 75 seconds. So yep. the clock was set. At 75 so yep. you do whatever run it in 72 73 seconds yep. and then yeah 75 repeat. off exactly yeah and Mate, that's a fair workout it's brutal yeah it's brutal and i, I did a i did a lot of it yeah um, and yeah i pr probably overdid it i would say a little bit with that stuff but it you know it certainly helped me build up my my stamina and you know mental strength as well 
I would think it would have to mentally because, yeah. like we said, it, it's bloody hard. Once you get to 200, you look around, you've still got half the track to go. It's it's a long bloody way. Yeah. Yeah, and I think because of how tennis is, and I think probably the case with a lot of individual sports is that obviously the psychological mm. side is is important. And if you believe in your head that, like, I've worked harder than the guy on the other side of the yeah. net, yep. you know, in the critical moments and stuff or in the really long matches or the horrible conditions, like if it's, you know, 40 degrees in Melbourne or whatever and you're in the, you know, third, fourth hour of a match, if that's in you and you believe that you've, you've done the extra work than mm-hmm. the guy on the other side, then that, 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 that can give you an edge. Yeah. Now, I know uh, Roger Rashida, who is an Adelaide boy, was coaching uh, Grigor Dimitrov yeah. at the time, and I reckon you're trying to Jez Green. Yeah. Now, is this true that one day around Wimbledon time, there was this big argument on who would run the best 200 metres? And yes. And you ended up, Roger took on Jez. Yeah. Now, Roger would have had the shirt off because all he does is bicep curls <laughs> nowadays and just tries to have the yeah. uh, the veins rippling. They ended up having a 200-meter run. that Didn't it stop a school sports day or something? Well, that, that was the thing that was incredible about it was that, I mean, they'd, Jez and Roger had built this up into their head that it was a, you know, a huge thing. Like the Olympics? Exactly. <laughs> In, I think Roger went and bought like running spikes and everything for it. That doesn't uh, which surprise is, me. Which is funny. And anyway, it was the week before Wimbledon and off. We went, I think after pressing in the mm. morning, we went like me and Grigor, Jez and Roger. And I think the ATP maybe brought, a, you know, a, like a camera along and stuff. Yeah. But then when we turned up at this place where I used to go and do my training, I've never seen anyone there. It's always, you know, dead. Yeah that it was, yeah, it was, it was a school kids sports day and it was packed. There was so many children there, <laughs> lo- loads of people. And, you know, they, they agreed to, you know, allow them to have their, to have their race. And it was- So they actually disrupted the school sports day and stopped it. Exactly, yeah, exactly. To run a very slow 200 meter. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was a very average level, but um, they, they tried hard. Do you remember who won? Did Roger beat Jez? Roger, Roger just won. Oh, he, no. he, he suggested that he sort of eased up at the end oh, to make no. it close, but yeah, you can imagine <laughs> how, he, how he reacted to I that I could win. imagine. Yeah. He's, pro- he's still talking about it now. He told yeah. me about this the other day because I said, I'm catching up with Andy Murray. And he goes, you've got to ask him about my brilliant 200 metres. And I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ, Roger. And nothing with all that preparation because you were so meticulous of it. Now, another little whisper I heard, and this came from another Adelaide boy, Darren Cahill, who we all know in the world of tennis is uh, a wonderful coach and was a great player. Um, he, he mentioned once that you were playing, I think you may have lost to Richard Gasquet in Rome, and he may have said to you, I think I said, how, how did you feel? Is it true you said that one night you woke up and you felt that you'd neglected your calves? Is this a true story? And he reckons that you got out of bed because <laughs> you'd woken up in the middle of the night and thought that your calves needed some work, and he reckons that you said you were doing squats nude or calf raises to get the calves ready. Now, is that a true story? Is he making that up? It sounds like the sort of thing that I would do, <laughs> um, whether I was doing them in the nude or not. Uh, I Maybe don't know. He added that? Yeah, he might have added that. <laughs> but yeah, that that sounds like the sort of thing that I would I would do. And so, I've become less like that as I as I've got older, and actually since. Um, since having kids that's actually helped to take my mind off yep. tennis a bit and I think yeah there's probably times like earlier in my career where I was just always like analyzing like everything mm-hmm. you know especially after losses and defeats like what you know what like w- like what happened there what could I be doing differently like have I not done enough in you know in the gym of a you know is there something I need to work on with my serve and you know wasn't always probably the the healthiest sort of yep. way to sort of think and be. I think I noticed I've got three kids, and I think your your eldest is six or seven. Is that right? Yeah, she's seven. In she's February. seven. Yeah, and then you got three others. So you got four. You all got your hands full. Very four, full. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So I noticed my kids are ten, seven, and six. The first time I saw my son pop out, my whole mindset of the world changed. Yeah, You know, like the perception completely changed of it's not just me now and my wife, or whatever. It's actually a family now responsible for this little person. Mm-hmm. Did you notice that as a dad? Like you're saying that everything changes? Yeah, I mean. Even for yeah. someone who has to be so single-mindedly focused on your sport as well? Yeah, so it, yeah, it, it did change for sure. Um, I mean, 
lots of things stayed the same. But I just, when it came to my my tennis, is that beforehand, like before I had children or anything, like I I was probably more selfish, and I think a lot of tennis players are, and maybe you have to be to be, yeah. you know, very successful. But yeah, when when we had our our first kid, it definitely made me like. I responded differently to winning and losing tennis matches. Like I didn't spend like five hours like really sad about a loss. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't spend, you know, loads of time like celebrating a win or, you know, getting so high from from a victory because my attention after matches would turn to more to family and my, mm -hmm. you know, my children and and stuff so throughout the year i would say like yeah i was just a bit more level-headed like mm. off the court rather than getting the ups and downs as much from from tennis does that make life easier as a professional to be in that mindset rather than like you're saying that super intense focus of up and down yeah i mean i think there's there's positives and, and negatives uh to it. i mean you know the yeah the positives are that i don't yeah, I think it's better just to be to be more level headed anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um I still do get the highs and lows from winning and losing. It's just not quite as drastic and extreme as what it was before. But then yeah, like it's but it's also something that is factored into decision making now around like scheduling and, you know, how much traveling to do and maybe, you know, if you have a training period, like whereabouts do you do that? Whereas beforehand it was like you you know, just do what do whatever it takes. Now, I still train and work extremely hard, but some of the decisions as well are factored around my, my children, my, my mm -hmm. family, and I'm more than happy to make that sacrifice on the tennis side, you know, to make sure that I'm not spending like eight weeks away from my family yeah. at a time. I want to make sure that, you know, I'm, uh, me and my family actually spoke about it last year, was like trying to make sure that like four weeks is kind of like the maximum that, I'm away from home in a row because I was I was struggling during like the US Open stretch. That was yeah. like six, six and a half weeks. And I was like, it just, it, it felt felt too long yep. to be away from them. Speaking of kids, if you're happy, can we go back to when you were a youngster? Yeah. Can we call you a child prodigy? Is that okay? Is that, do you reckon that's the right term? Because you're obviously pretty good. You're playing tournaments at five, weren't you, essentially? As a kid. Yeah, but but I, <laughs> I mean, again, the, the tennis level in Scotland was very average. Um, but yeah, we we used to play like yeah against at, like at our local club. Me and my brother would play against the well, yeah, the the, 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 the men, yeah, yeah, the adults from when we were six, seven years old, probably. Yeah. So that was at Central District. Yeah, tennis exactly. club, wasn't it? So yeah. you and Jamie, and what's Jamie about fifteen months old? Yes. So you're taking on these blokes mm. and beating them. <laughs> well, yeah, we we were doing pretty well. We didn't know how to keep score or anything at that <laughs> age, um, so they had to keep score and everything. But yeah, in terms of like shot for shot, like playing, like and they yeah, would have been we calling the outs in that too, wouldn't they? Yeah, cheating, exactly, probably. And were they getting pissed off that two young boys were making a mess of them? Um, I don't, I don't remember that as much. I just remember like when we were that age, we were just rocking up and just playing, and it was fun, and it was. Mm. It was cool, and like I said, like we didn't really know about the winning and losing and the scores and everything at that stage. But yeah, like looking back, I would think that if I was playing a game against a five-year-old at anything and I was losing, yeah, oh. I'd struggle with that, especially when they don't know the rules. Mate, if you're playing Uno or Monopoly yeah. against one of your kids now, because your yeah. kids are that age, like imagine you're one of your kids making a mess of you. Clearly, they're not going to on the tennis court, but imagine yeah. if you were average. And one of your kids starts making them, you'd actually I'd feel, struggle. I'd struggle with that. Yeah. I think we'd all would, wouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> so at what point, because obviously Jamie being a little older, and when you're little, you know, when you're five, six, seven, eight, 15 months or whatever it is, is a big gap, isn't yeah. it, physically? How did you guys go? Because obviously you would have played with and against each other a little bit hitting. Was it fiery? What was the competition like as brothers? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was hard for me. Um, and I see it now with my own children is that, mm -hmm. Our, our second child yep. because she's so she's about 18 months younger than than our eldest one is that yep. 
the older one is always a little bit bigger, a little bit yeah. smarter, is always a little bit better at everything. Yeah. So the second child, you know, gets used to losing at stuff from a younger age, but is also, I think, more motivated because, you know, you want to be able to win and beat your beat your siblings and stuff. Yes. And it's frustrating when you can't when you can't do that. And it was I think it was when I were around probably eight or nine was yeah. when I'd started to win against Jamie. Like right. not all the time, but like for the first times. But I do think that and this maybe this is just because of my own experience, mm. but I would say that second children are probably a, a little bit more competitive naturally. Yeah. Well, it's not natural. I think it's more yeah. because of their environment yep. than maybe the the first child. That was certainly the case with me and my brother, but yeah. also I've seen it with with my own children as well. Can you remember when you first beat him? Yeah, well, I, I remember that it was at at, at tournament in Solihull. I mean, I, it was in the final of the tournament. I think it was a, a ten and under event, mm. uh, and I was eight. Jamie was nine. And yeah, so that that was that was when it happened for for the first time. How did he take it? Uh, <laughs> I think he took it okay, but not so much the aftermath because I don't think I shut up about it. For uh, we, we had to take the like a, a mini bus home. Like our mum used to take me and my brother and some of the other Scottish kids to a lot of the tournaments uh, yeah. down south in in England and. Solihull was one of those places, probably right. like a six, six, seven hour drive home. A long enough time to brag. Yeah. And you um, gave him a fair bit? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Didn't, well, didn't that's, stop. That's probably a bit of payback from all the times you would have beaten you up as a little well, fellow. Well, exactly. It? Yeah. But the, in, interestingly, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I think like, no, like he, he probably, he dealt with it, I would say, probably pretty well, like as we got older. Mm. But I think initially, that's also not that easy to deal with either when you know you've been competing against someone for a really long time and you never yeah. lose to them at anything yeah you know when that starts to happen is probably also not that easy so at eight you beat your brother and you know you've sort of start to get on top of him at what point in your career andy did you know you were world class was there a moment was there an event or was it just something happened in time where you went I can actually compete with the very best. I can be the very best. Um, so the first time I knew that internationally that I was good was when we went to play the Orange Bowl, which mm -hmm. is at the time it was, it's, well, I don't even know if now it's still considered that, but it's one of the bigger junior tournaments. And it was like unofficially at the time was like the sort of world championships of, you know yep. junior tennis and i won the 12 and under event uh then so over in florida mm. uh and that was a really big deal at the time and i think that was like when probably well, well like i started to realize that you know internationally i was i was good and i think yeah. my family were like okay well you know this is maybe something worth sort of pursuing uh you know a bit more um but then I guess as I got older, when I went over to train in Spain, um, I I practiced with like so. This is when I was like fifteen, sixteen. I got to practice with like Carlos Moya and oh, yeah. Guillermo Coria, and the guy who ran the academy, academy Emilio Sanchez. Um, I practiced with him as well a little bit, and he was he was older and had retired, but had been a you know top ten player and stuff. Also played against uh, Carlos Costa, who is Rafa Nadal's agent, but also used to be, you know, very good player as well. And, you know, I practiced with all of those guys when I was there and, yep. you know, handled myself well. Um, mm. And I think probably then was maybe when I started to realize around that age, like 15, yeah. 16, when I was on the court with, you know, when I would go to Davis Cup and play with like Tim Hemman and Greg mm. Rosetsky and, you know, would win practice sets and stuff against them. You know, at that age, I probably realized that, you know, yeah. I could I could compete with them, that it was mm. possible for me to, yeah. you know, get on the tour. So you become world class and then you, you start making finals. 
like Ivan Lendl, you lose your first four major finals yeah. and then Ivan comes with you. And was that part of the reason why you chose Ivan? Because he'd been through that point, try and help you get to that top of the mountain? It, it wasn't, but it was a big benefit for me when we did start working with each other because when I started discussing, you know, the slams and the major finals mm. and stuff. Um, and, you know, Ivan was, he was always considered to be like, um, we showed no emotion on the court and that, you know, mentally was considered to be, you know, very, very strong mm. mentally. That when I started to talk to him about the nerves and the pressure and everything and how he coped with it and how he felt, you know, he told me that, you know, he used to vomit before slam finals and he used to get, you know, unbelievably nervous. And, you know, that, that really helped me because having someone by your side who has been through the same sort of thing and has also, like, even though when he was on the court, he didn't show anything, mm. you know, that he felt that same stuff. Mm. It sort of normalized it for me because, you know, before then, and it, I, th this is not, I'm not saying this to take away from any of the coaches that I worked with before, and it was not their fault that I lost in slam finals at all, but it just having someone who'd had that experience and being able to talk to them about that, yeah, it just helped me cope with those situations better. You get to that US Open in 2012, obviously win. After all of that and the build-up, and I suppose being in Britain because it's been, what, since 1936, since Fred Perry had won as a male, and was it? Virginia Wade, 77. Could you feel this pressure mounting? I mean, you, you're one of the most famous sports people on the planet and you've got all this attention. I imagine it could only be huge back home. How did you feel in that build-up to getting to that tournament and going through to the final? Could, was there a massive weight of expectation you could feel? Well, I mean, I played in the Wimbledon final two months beforehand and lost, and that was... Probably that was the first time in a slam final where I felt like I could have 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 won the match. Mm. That you know the first three finals that I played I didn't really have any yeah. chances to to win and hadn't really hadn't really played that well. But in the Wimbledon final, like I was up a set, um, I had chances to break early in the second set, and it was it was a it was a tight match. I I, I could have won that final and. I, I was I was pretty shattered after I lost that one to to be honest but it also ar around that time so just afterwards I probably I started to accept that I might not win a slam because uh, up until that point like everyone was always saying well the media would always ask me when are you going to win a slam so even when I won you know, any other tournament, yeah. a Masters Series or one of the, yep. you know, bigger tournaments on mm. tour, it was always like, well, you know, when's he going to win a slam? And mm. it was always, why isn't he doing it? What's the yeah. reason? And yeah. a lot of the players were saying, oh, it's just a matter of time. Like, yeah, you know, you'll definitely win one of these, et cetera, et cetera. So it was, it was really difficult, but it wasn't until I accepted that I might not win one and that, you know, I was doing everything that I could to give myself the best chance. So I felt like I was working extremely hard. You know, I had a really good team of people around me. You know, mentally I was in a good place. Um, that, yeah, it was like, if it doesn't happen, then, you know, it doesn't happen, but I'm doing everything that I can. So you essentially remove the expectation of winning. Yeah. And because didn't you, not long after that, um, that Wimbledon in 2012, you went back to Wimbledon and obviously beat... Uh, Roger pretty comfortably for the gold medal at the Olympics. Yeah. So was that the gold medal from the Olympics? Did that happen after you sort of made that that acceptance to yourself that perhaps I might not win a slam? Yeah, I, th I think so. Um, I mean, there was other factors that went into that when that the Olympics at Wimbledon yeah. and my experience four years beforehand in Beijing had had helped with that. But yeah, definitely. Yeah, just I accept I accepted it. I accepted the defeat. You know, it took a few days. And I was yeah. I was really upset by the Wimbledon final, but I accepted it and I got back to work and you know I, I I trained really hard to get ready for the Olympics and then yeah obviously going into that U.S. Open final it was interestingly by far the most nervous that I've that I'd ever been going into a Slam final and I think 
it was probably because I really believed that, you know, I, I could do it. Like I was ready, yeah. you know, maybe. And, and that's one of the challenging things for me is that a lot of the slam finals and stuff that I played, I was playing against, like obviously played against Roger a couple of times mm. who, um, yeah. you know, you know, he'd won 10, 12 slams when I was playing against him and against Novak as well. Mm. These guys were all multiple slam winners and knew exactly what it took. And I probably didn't, yeah, felt a bit uncomfortable going into yeah. some of those matchups. And and I'm not saying there's no pressure on them, but I probably felt a little bit more because I'd never mm. won one. Yep. So then, yeah, for me, you know, going into that US Open final off the back of the loss at Wimbledon, you yeah. know, accepting it, feeling like I was doing everything I could, then winning the Olympics, that I sort of felt ready. Like yeah. mentally, I was ready for that match. I believed that I could win. The conditions that day were pretty good for me. It was very, very windy, which I've always liked playing in the wind. I know Novak doesn't like it that much, that I just, I felt ready to do it. But I was unbelievably nervous before that final. What was it like when you won? What was the main overwhelming emotion? Just relief, really. And I think, again, like probably because of what I'd built it up to in my head. And like I was saying, you know, when Darren told you that story about the yeah. calves and stuff is that it probably is not the best mindset to, to mm. have. Um, although I know quite a lot of athletes that have, you know, are the same sort of way is that, yeah, I just built it up to be something so big in my head, like winning a grand slam. And, you know, I think a lot of the, the media had also done that with me as well and made me feel like if you don't do this, like yeah. you, you have failed, like yeah. he can't win a slam because he's not fit enough or mentally he's not strong enough or whatever. Is that, yeah, a lot of my, yeah, career was about trying to win a major and that when I finally did it, yeah, I was just, I was just relieved. It wasn't excitement, happiness. It was relief that I'd done it. And I sort of wish that that moment had felt different. And I think nowadays, like, if I, and, and in 2016, when I won Wimbledon, yep. I had the right emotions for that win. Because yes. I told myself, like, after the 2013 Wimbledon, where it was the same sort of thing, I was just like, I was exhausted. Mm. I was like, I remember lying in the hotel room after that match, and I was just like, I, I wasn't like over the moon, like excited and happy. I was just like, I was just exhausted. I was so tired, probably yeah, because yeah. of all, everything I built up in my head yeah. and the pressure around, you know, 77 years and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. But on reflection, like six, eight weeks afterwards, I said to my team, I was like, if I ever do anything like that again, we're celebrating this properly and we, I'm going to be around the people that I want to be around. I'm going to have my family. I'm going to have my friends. You know, I'm not doing all the other stuff that goes with it. I want to enjoy that moment. And 2016, when I won Wimbledon, I, I did. And I celebrated appropriately and I spent it with all the right people. And that for me was my, my best memory on a tennis court was that one. How good was that that you got the chance to get it a second time so that you could actually do that? That's that's bloody brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'm not saying I would necessarily like, you know, change all of those things in, in my career. You know, I just, I wish that, yeah, I wish that I hadn't built it up to be something like so much in, in my head. And then I think, you know, I probably would have enjoyed those moments better, but I think it's understandable that that's where I was mentally because of, of how everything was had gone in my career up to that point and with British tennis and the history and everything around Wimbledon. But yeah, it was lucky. I was fortunate that I got the opportunity to <laughs> to do it again. You're Sir Andy Murray. You were you were knighted at 29 years of age, mm. obviously after that wonderful 2016, which was just amazing. What, what do you get for being a knight besides the title? And no nothing as far as I'm aware. I haven't got anything from it yet. Um, can you go into Buckingham Palace when you feel comfortable? Yeah, you get You can. No, no. <laughs> it's not like winning no. Wimbledon and you can... No, you uh, don't get the keys, get the, no. They don't give you anything? No, nothing. Uh, you and Prince Charles do the sword thing, didn't you? Yes, he, he, yeah, he did it, yeah. 
king. Well, yeah, he was prince at the time, but yes. now, yeah, now a yeah, king. king. Yeah. But what was that moment like when you you saw Andy Murray? It's strange, uh, to be honest, and something that, yeah, like I was grateful, obviously, for the recognition and everything. Um, I also. I don't know, like I also felt a bit uncomfortable with that because of my age and I don't know, like if I'd always sort of, I don't know, like calling people like sir or yes. whatever, I don't know, it was always sort of like reserved for like, I don't know, like teachers or your elders and everything. And then, yeah, I just, I felt very young to, well, you're to have that You're title. the youngest knight in history. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't, yeah, I, I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, it was it was really young and yeah. probably something that, yeah, I mean, if it had come probably after my career and stuff, might um, might have been been better. I don't know, but yeah, that was I, I just I don't know. I've yeah. always felt a bit uncomfortable with that title, probably. The other one I want to ask you about is I think twice you've won the Arthur Ashe Humanitarian Award. I think it was last year you said that when you saw what was happening with the Ukraine and Russia, you went, right, I'm going to donate all my prize money for this year to the UNICEF. Mm -hmm. um, you must be enormously proud. And this, I suppose, is part of growing as a man and becoming a father that you start thinking outside of just Andy Murray, the tennis player. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly like in my early 20s, again, like I was saying, like, just you like you're just only really thinking about like yourself mm. um and i'm not saying that that's the right way to not, not saying that's the right way to think but that that was that was how it was like, i was thinking yeah. about myself and my tennis and kind of that was it and then about my, my mid-20s one of my best friends um got diagnosed with cancer and that was really when i started feeling like i wanted to do more um you know to try and help causes that that really touched me or meant something yeah. to me and you know we did a few events around queen's time which you know really helped with more well, yeah fundraising and awareness for mm. the the cancer that he, that, that he had and you know I, I really enjoyed doing it as well it, it felt felt really great being able to to help in that way and then yeah obviously with everything that was going on um you know in ukraine and sort of again since having children and stuff like i've found those sorts of images and seeing you know children suffering or being away from their families and you know getting displaced from from home and i mean it's to, to put yourself in that situation I, I can't imagine what i would do if that was my children i just know that must be absolutely horrific and yeah just one mm. the only thing that i probably felt like i could do in that situation is to you know, donate funds to try and help kids yeah. who are in, you know, brutal situations. And, um, yeah, hopefully the money went some way yeah. to, to help with that. Well, mate, I think it's awesome. Hats off to you for being able to use your platform and all the wonderful stuff you've done to help people in that way. I think it's absolutely magnificent. 2022, of course, you get back in the top 50. I think you got a final in Stuttgart. So you're back, hips going well. What's left to do in tennis? What would you like to still do? Uh, well, I, I want to I want to see how far I can go with well with the the, the hip that I've got. Mm. So, because uh, quite a few athletes since have sort of asked me about it, like from different sports, like football players, ice hockey players, basketball players, and stuff who have had problems and have sort of said to me like, "Well, how good is it? Like, mm. you know, is it worth doing?" And I would say yes, but I also don't know like what the limit is yep. you know i've got back up into the top 50 in the world which you know i'm not delighted with that but i also started last year ranked 130 or something so it was quite a big jump but i do also feel like i can do a lot better than what i did mm. in the last season so i think i'll keep moving forwards um i think my ranking will keep going in the right direction and yeah, I want to. I want to perform better and have good runs in the biggest tournaments at the Slams. And yeah, hopefully still, I can start. Still got that. a big moment in there. I think so. Yeah, I I, I genuinely think so. And th there's been a lot of inconsistency with my tennis over the last couple of years. But if you look at some of the wins that are in there, there's there's been a lot of them against guys that are in the top twenty in the world just now. 
I think with my body the way that it is just now and the way that I'm moving is significantly better than what it was nine, ten months ago. Mm. I put a lot of hard work in in the off season. Um, I've got a good team around me, and yeah, providing I stay fit, um, I, I do still think I, I've got some big moments left in me. The R word retirement, you've probably braced it for many years given what you had with the hip. Um, there's no finish line yet? N no, but I also have to, yeah, I have to be mindful of how the last few years have been and also my age. Like, if I was to have another big injury, I probably wouldn't try to come back from that. Um, if something happened to the hip, which is always a possibility, well, I can't recover um, mm -hmm. from that. I would have to have another yeah. operation to, to fix it, and that would be the end. So, yeah, I, I, I have to treat these moments and, like, this trip here, like, that I might not get this opportunity again. So I try to make sure that I make the most of it. And, you know, hopefully I come back to Australia, you know, for quite a few more years. But I don't, I don't know that, and I can't say it for certain. So... I want, to, I want to treat it like it might be the last time I'm here so that I make the most of it. I really appreciate you being accommodating. But really looking forward to seeing you here in Adelaide. But uh, I want to see you go deep in the second week of the Australian Open in a couple of weeks' time, mate. Thanks so much for Thank your time. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, guys, thanks so much for listening. Now, if you love what you just heard, please subscribe to the Soda Room podcast. You could write a review. Uh, you can watch the show on YouTube and share it with your buddies. And if you'd like to get in touch with the show, drop us a line info at thesodaroom.com. Catch you soon.